I'm Dr. Robin Smith, and on behalf of the Cura Foundation and the Vatican's Pontifical Council for Culture, I'd like to welcome you today to the second webinar in Bridging Science and Faith series that's brought to you with the support of the John Templeton Foundation and Sanford Health. This series explores how religion, faith, and spirituality influence our health, and it looks for relationships between the mind, body, and soul, as well as the convergence between humanities and natural sciences. Today's webinar will speak to human uniqueness and qualities such as the ability to reason, free will, decision-making, and moral reasoning. We'll highlight interdisciplinary research and developments in genetics, neurosciences, and artificial intelligence that have influenced the definitions of what is meant to be human. We're honored to introduce today's moderator, CBS2 New York Senior Correspondent and Trustee of the Cura Foundation, Dr. Max Gomez. And we're thrilled to welcome our esteemed speakers, Dr. Marcus Gabriel, Chair in Epistemology, Modern and Contemporary Philosophy and Director of International Center for Philosophy and Center of Science and Thought at the University of Bonn in Germany. Dr. Jane Goodall, a Dane Commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, founder of the Jane Goodall Institute and the UN Messenger of Peace. She is a foremost expert and trailblazer in the field of ethology, and is a well-known conservationist. We also have Dr. William Mobley, the Associate Dean for Neuroscience Initiatives and Interim Director of the Sanford Institute for Empathy and Compassion at the Department of Neurosciences at the University of California, San Diego. And Dr. George Steiner, Associate Professor in the Department of Philosophy at Villanova University and Editor-in-Chief of the Social Epistemology Journal. Max, over to you. Thanks, Robin. You know, I am happy to welcome our esteemed participants for this discussion today. But before we proceed, I think we would be remiss we did not acknowledge that today is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. It's perhaps appropriate our discussion today falls his day of remembrance because MLK has his own views as to what makes us human, values of forgiveness, nonviolence, reconciliation, and unconditional love. Well, that's not exactly on point for our discussion today. We'd all do well to remember those qualities. As we'll see, some of the qualities that unite us all and influence our humanity may not be exclusive to Homo sapiens. Today, we'll examine what makes us different from other species, what it really means to be human, as scientific advancements continue to mold and blur the definition of humanness. So welcome all. Now, I've asked the permission of our panelists to address them by their first names. So to set the stage, let's have each of our panelists tell us a little bit about their perspectives on the topic of human uniqueness. And uh, Jane, would you start us off, please? When I went out to study chimpanzees and I hadn't been to college, I was just an animal lover from childhood. And Dr. Lewis Leakey sent me out and very soon I discovered so many similarities between the chimpanzees and ourselves in many areas. And I was absolutely shocked when two years later, I got to Cambridge University in the UK and was told the difference between us and other animals is one of kind. That was in the early 60s. And I was told I couldn't talk about chimpanzee personality, mind, or emotion, because those were qualities unique to us. Fortunately, I'd learned that that was wrong from my dog when I was a child, and I was able to stand up to the professors. And I think it's just because chimpanzees are so like us that we can stand back and say, yes, they're so like us, but we are different, and ask ourselves what that difference is. I think we will explore that a little bit later on. George, what is your take? Tell me where your perspective is here. Thank you for having me. Um, philosophers such as myself are fond of pondering the mind-body problem, or more generally, the relation between matter and spirit. In this context, considering the Judeo-Christian notion that human beings are created in the image and likeness of God, we see that the mind-body problem is an expression of the idea that human beings, or humanity, is uniquely suspended between the animal and the divine. To be sure, some conceptions would put us closer to divinity, others put us closer to animality. Like, are we primarily low-grade creators or high-grade creatures? My approach to human uniqueness has been to seek a middle ground that would allow us to maintain both, 
that on the one hand, we are biological organisms rooted in the natural world, just like other animals. Yet on the other hand, we're not part of nature in the same way as they are. Now, how can that be? How can we assert a psychological discontinuity when all we observe is biological continuity? The short answer is there's a hidden third party in the mind-body problem, and that's technology, specifically the enculturating effects of technology. The human mind is a product of biological evolution as much as it is an artifact of our own making. The process of becoming human is inextricably entwined with our ability to redesign our environments courtesy of the most significant feature of our brains, its enormous plasticity in ways that completely alter our relationship to the environment as organic beings. And in this process, we also re-engineer ourselves as social and cultural beings. The Canadian media theorist Marshall McLuhan, a Roman Catholic convert, popularized this idea with the slogan that media are extensions of mankind, extensions of our bodies, like the wheel, the ax, or our clothing, extensions of our senses, the mirror, the camera, the telescope, and extensions of our minds. Think of language, writing, and the computer. What these mind extensions do is distribute cognition in space, across time, and among people in ways that allow us to do things that would otherwise baffle our naked brains. Nowadays, this idea is known as the extended mind thesis. So anticipating our conversation, I entirely agree with Jane and others that animals have been found to possess in more or less rudimentary form many traits previously regarded as unique to humans. Tool use, self-awareness, mind reading, moral cognition, the ability to experience complex emotions such as grief or awe or personality traits. However, I would argue that none of them has the same ability to extend, transform, refine, and sublimate these rudimentary forms in ways that come natural to human beings. We should think of humanity as a cyborg species. It is part of human nature to transcend nature. Oh, and we are going to explore some of those topics as we get a little further along. Uh, Bill, you come to this from a somewhat different uh, point of view as a, as a neuroscientist. Uh, talk to us about that perspective. Thank you, Max, and thanks to all the panelists. You know, for me, the challenge is to understand the neurobiological basis for everything George just talked about. I mean, what's the neurological basis of being able to create a theory of mind? What's the biological basis of being able to talk about cyborgs and artificial intelligence? And the neurobiologist in me suggests that many of the processes that are really in instantiated in brain, in the human brain, or are there in animal brains. In fact, many of them are in, you know, invertebrate brains. And so the challenge, I think, for me is less philosophical and more biological. In essence, what I want to do and what my colleagues do every day is to watch the brain work, learn how it works, and learn how it can take a complex statement of the kind that George just gave us and turn it into biological substrates of meaning. That, that to me maybe distinguishes humans from other animals in maybe one of the most powerful ways, the search for meaning in our existence. It is in the brain and we can understand it in the brain. And I think what we'll find and are finding is that the brain mechanisms that subserve the search for meaning are not so very different between humans and other animals. Finally, Marcus, you get the, the last self-introduction, please. Well, it's a great pleasure and uh, honor to be part of this uh, discussion. So my starting point, my entry point to the topic of so-called anthropolo uh, anthropological difference, so what makes humans unique, unique is the assumption that the human being is another animal. And uh, I would like to highlight that the entire tradition of philosophy has actually never been denying that fact. So one of the first uh, most prominent definitions of the human being, harking back as far as Aristotle tells us that we are animals with what he calls a logos. It's very hard to say what logos is. Is it reason? Is it language? What exactly makes us unique in the animal kingdom has ever since been 
you know, the object of various debates, but actually no one has ever really denied that we, uh, that we are animals. However, something has changed, of course, over the course of uh, modernity, namely our conception of the animal. And I think that this has arguably, in the wake, of course, of the Darwinian revolution, progresses in particular in the life sciences, this has led to the idea that there might be a huge split between us and the rest of the animal uh, kingdom, which I think is simply not the case. So I'm in a certain sense a so-called continuist. So I think there's clearly a continuity between us and the other animals. But what is crucial is to think of ourselves as animals. However, I want to suggest and discuss uh, with you today that there's a specific sense in which we're animals and it turns around our capacity to think of ourselves as animals and as part of the widest possible landscape of the universe. So probably, right, this is an empirical hypothesis, I might be entirely wrong about this, but probably no other known animal on planet Earth at least thinks about the fact that we are animals in contrast to inanimate nature to other animals. So we do certain things in light of a conception of ourselves as the kinds of animals which run seminars and webinars about what it is to be this kind of animal. And this has so far not been observed among our fellow creatures. And I think there's something that makes us unique in that respect, but it is not entirely clear to which extent this can be mapped onto the vocabulary available to the life sciences, in particular biology. So I think there are some open questions about the biological correlate of this capacity to think of oneself as an animal, uh, which I call Geist in German, which roughly translates into spirit as German. So long story short, I think we are specifically minded animals, but animals nonetheless. Very good, very good. Jane, let me let let me start with you because obviously you've spent um, uh, more time, I think, observing obviously uh, animals, particularly chimpanzees, than than all the rest of us, uh, uh, non-human versus human primates. And I say uh, non-human because I suspect that the line between human and non-human primates has uh, has become somewhat blurry. But, you know, where do humans fit into the spectrum of primates and 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 other animals and do you believe there are any characteristics in that make us truly human and separate us from for example chimpanzees i think where we fit in into the picture of primates is we are the fifth great ape and uh, our closest relative among the other great apes well there's two of them actually the chimpanzee and the bonobo and we differ from each other genetically by only just over one percent so that puts us very clearly into biologically um, amongst the other great apes. But then, you know, I ended off at the beginning by saying, you can step back then and say, yes, but we're different. And a lot of this has been said already. I mean, chimpanzees can be taught sign language. They can learn to use a computer. From this, we've been able to tell something about the way their minds work. But even the brightest chimpanzee, and some of them can learn up to 600 signs and uh, communicate with each other as well as their teacher. They, they can paint and they'll tell you what they've painted. And it's interesting to see how their minds differ though. One chimpanzee, four years old, loved to make drawings. She, she'd been taught sign language and she was asked to do a drawing. She usually filled up the page with circles. And on this occasion, she just drew like that and handed the paper back. So her teacher said, please finish. And the chimpanzee looked at it and handed it back and signed finished. So the teacher then said, what is it? And the chimpanzee signed back, ball, a ball. What has she done? She's drawn the bounce of a ball. And that to me is absolutely a fascinating glimpse into their minds. But okay, so you ask what makes us different? And this also has been said, but I think it's really important that at some point during our evolution, we learned a language which enabled us to communicate with words. And although chimpanzees can be taught words, they haven't developed that ability. 
They communicate with rich variety of postures and gestures, which we use too. We share those, those uh, co ways of communication. But this, this sudden development of the use of words, it enables us to teach children about things that aren't present. And it enables us to make plans for the distant future. Chimpanzees can plan, let's go hunting now. They look at each other, they touch each other, and they set off on a hunt. But we can sit down and make a plan for 10 years time. We could, with the use of words and language, we developed writing. And I think this triggered this explosive development of the intellect which has led to our ability to do all these things that was talked about earlier, to develop telescopes and binoculars, to develop rockets that go up to Mars from which a little robot crawls to take photos uh, of, of the red planet, the surface of the red planet. But then when you realize how like us chimpanzees are and yet how we differ with this explosive development of the intellect, this development of the intellect has not given us a reason to label ourselves as homo sapiens, the wise ape. We're not wise. We've seen what Mars looks like. We don't want to live there. We've only got this one planet, at least in our lifetimes, and we're destroying it. So it's an extraordinary difference that we've become extremely intellectual and we've lost the wisdom of living in our environment in a sustainable way. That could take us off into an entirely different conversation, but since you raised language, uh, Marcus is, language has often been uh, sort of used as this is what really separates us, the, the spoken language, the written language. Um, what's your take on that? Is that really that unique? Is that the defining difference? Well, I take to believe that language is uh, an expression of thought. So, you know, language enables us to do lots of things, right? So that different human practices can emerge from the use of language. Uh, in particular, of course, it shapes our memory, et cetera, in the form of, you know, what George has reminded us of, that our mind is somewhat extended, right? We have re devices of recording, et cetera. But I think there's something about human thought that might be uh, unique. Namely, that it has a specific logical architecture that enables us precisely to think about distant things, etc. And I think that human thought is not linguistically coded. So I don't think that we think in language, but I think, which is a very classical view of language as an expression of thought. So I would go a little deeper and think that there's something specific about human thought, which enables us to be speakers of natural languages, but also producers of artificial <laughs> languages. So I think that. There, there, there's even a deeper level of logically structured rational thought uh, that might be unique to humans, uh, but this is an open question whether we might also find it in other animals. And this gives rise to the kind of phenomena that are typically associated with language. So, you know, I think there's something even deeper than language. But there's said that whales, dolphins, others communicate, have a language. Uh, but we don't really know how deep that, that goes in terms of their thought processes, as you were saying? Absolutely. So I would not at all hesitate to call this a language, right? There, has been, there have been quarrels about whether whale language is language, and I think the answer has just been given. It's whale language. So I have no quarrel about that. I think that, you know, human languages might be unique in virtue of an underlying thought architecture, right? So, you know, and uh, this is where, you know, we are, we are different, we think differently, right? So for instance, we're in touch with infinity, you know, the, the, the other animals might not be doing this, right? We think about the universe as a whole. We think about, you know, God and gods, and we have religions on this basis. And we, you know, and I think it's an open question whether other animals have it, and I tend to think they don't, but it's an empirical, hypothesis, which might be disproved in the way in which Jane, for instance, with her work, has disproven some hypotheses about human uniqueness. Come back to that later. <laughs> Good, please. Uh, Bill, let's, let's talk because if, uh, as Jane said, we're 1% different in, in terms of our genetics from chimpanzees. And, and as you pointed out, uh, 
the neuroanatomy that we can identify and see is virtually identical in other primates, uh, as it is in us, and perhaps even in, ver in invertebrates. So where does our humanness come from in, in our brain? Let me be clear that our brains certainly are very similar to non-human primates. And you can mark out cortical areas and brain regions that are you know, virtually identical and presumably serve similar purposes or the same purpose. There are differences between these brains, the complexity of brain structure does differ, the size of the brains differ. The way the genes are expressed is very likely to be different. So whereas chimps, for example, have virtually their adult size brains by several months of age, in humans that takes much longer. And so it's probably not just the structure of the genes, but how they're expressed, where they're expressed, and how their expression is modified by other genes. So yes, 1% is very, very close. However, it's how you use that 1% difference that may make a big difference in the way the brain develops. Let me, let me take a neurobiological perspective. It, it's just interesting to ask the question, if something can happen, but it doesn't naturally happen, why is that? So if chimps, can draw pictures and make meaning of balls bouncing. If they can learn and repeat words, they can use a computer. But chimps don't normally do that in the wild. We have a perfect laboratory in which to ask the question, what's the difference? What is it that's different about humans and chimps that naturally sees a child grow to, you know, play video games? And chimps simply don't do that. Is it really the brain? or is it the brain in context? And the context of, co of course for humans is a very different social cultural context. So the neurobiologist would say, if something obviously can happen in chimp and it doesn't happen on a natural basis, what is the underlying difference? Is it instantiated in brain, in neural connectivity, in size of brain, or the cultural context in which the brain develops? And I think those are, this is mostly about questions, Max, not about answers. I'm very, I'm very averse to the idea that we're so different from chimps that we need to continue to find reasons for being different from them, when in fact it may well be that absent some relatively simple set of processes in neurons, in cells, and the way the brain develops, we're very much like chimps. And in fact, we're very, very much like chimps in a way that suggests that we might even see chimps evolve over the next million years in ways that are very much like humans. George, I wanna to come to you in just a second because I have some specific question for you, but I think Bill raised some points that Jane would uh, like to address, specifically say if something, why, why don't chimps develop these sorts of communication skills or learn to use a computer if, if there were one around? Um, the brain theoretically could allow it to happen, but it doesn't. Is it just context? I wanted to go back to what Marcus said too, because, okay. you know, thinking, creating language, language creating thinking. I mean, to me, if I'm really trying to think something through, it totally helps me to write it down or to discuss it with somebody. It helps to clarify mm -hmm. what I'm thinking. And Marcus, you talked about this feeling of awe. Well, when chimpanzees come to this amazing waterfall that falls 80 feet through a narrow gorge that it's worn in the rock, and as they approach, sometimes the hair stands on end with excitement, and they do this extraordinary display. They sway from foot to foot in the shallow stream, which normally they avoid. And as they're swaying from foot to foot, they bend down, they pick up big rocks and throw them ahead of them. And then they may climb the vines and swing out into the spray, which is created uh, by the wind of this falling water displacing the air. And at the end, you can see them sitting and they're watching the water. And what is this stuff that's always coming? It's always here, and it's always going. And here's where I think language plays such an important part because they obviously share this feeling, which may be awe, maybe wonder, I don't know. 
but mm. uh, that's the sort of feeling I get. So I sort of empathize and think they probably do too. Now, if they could sit among themselves and talk about what is it to each other, couldn't that lead to the one of the early animistic religions, the worship of things that weren't understood by our ancestors, the sun, the moon, the waterfall. And so this is where I think language really does, spoken language, the language that we have developed, yes, chimps can learn it, but they haven't. And so I just feel that this is something which truly has triggered this push into making the not wise, but intellectual ape. Maybe because chimps don't need the language? Well, I think they do, really. I mean, you know, things happen. They have a very, very complex social structure. Mm -hmm. And it would help them enormously if they could discuss things and sit down together and say, well, you know, let's make out a plan and we'll just get this young upstart, teach him a lesson or two. But they have to do it individually or be together and touch each other and look, and then they can communicate. Language would help them a lot. So George, we've, we've mentioned, of course, language. What else? There, there are a lot of these sort of hard to get your hands around qualities that, that people uh, claim make us different from animals. Uh, ethics, uh, empathy, uh, morality. Um, what, what do you see as other qualities that really distinguish humans from other animals. Very briefly elaborate on this language as a social tool theme, because I think that's a very important theme. And, um, there's something I want to I want to contribute at this point. Um, the great Italian poet and philosopher Dante Alighieri made the point that language is unique to human beings. It's a it's a proprium, he said. And his reasoning was as follows. Angels don't need language because they're purely spiritual persons without physical bodies so they can directly read each other's minds. And animals don't need it, he said, because they can only vocalize species-specific desires, thus there are no personalized thoughts to be communicated among them. Now, Jane will heavily protest against the second, as would I, but I actually want to draw attention to the comparison with angels, which is quite instructive. In the context of Elon Musk and other people advertising Neuralink, specifically brain-to-brain -brain interfaces, as the next great leap in human communication. They would allow people to exchange information at such a high bandwidth that language might eventually become obsolete. Now, we might initially sympathize with Musk's proposal because all too often we find ourselves at a loss of words. But in light of Dante's observation, what he's inspiring is a template for angelic perfection. But is this template also good for human beings? And I think here's where Musk and many others overlook crucial features of language as a superb tool to distribute and calibrate agency across physically separate bodies, a tool for doing things together while maintaining individual flexibility and accountability. And there's two key features I want to highlight here, selection and negotiation. Language, on the one hand, it gives us the power to select what to keep private and what to make public by putting it into words. And negotiation, when we talk, we take turns. And this provides each interlocutor with opportunities for agreeing, disagreeing, for giving reasons, repairing misunderstandings, and establish just enough agreement to get the job done. And this may be sometimes very simple, such as mm-hmm or mm-hmm. Uh, so I think in light of this uh, comparison, brain-to-brain -brain interfaces might be good for optimizing the exchange of certain types of information, perhaps emotionally rich, idiosyncratic personal experiences. But if it were to replace language completely, this would come at a tremendous cost of throwing away part of the very infrastructure that makes human sociality possible. Interesting. So what about though, rational behavior, morality, that sort of thing? And I'd like you know all of you to chime in a little bit on that because again, that often is, is uh, put out as what really makes us different is uh, rational behavior. Well, if I can jump in uh, on 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 that yeah. one, right? So you know, I think that's you know, so there there seems to be something about you know rationality. That's why I think this is uh, somewhat uh, you know more fundamental than language. Depending on if we think of language as a tool, right, which was an option that we have been considering, or as something 
shaping human thought, right? So one possibility is that language is a tool for the expression of complex thought, which then changes human behavior, right? As a consequence of this tool like architecture. The other stronger view is that uh, language uh, is the way in which we think, right? And what I would like to deny is the idea that I think in, in German or think in English, right? A lot depends on what, you know, if we think of language as the natural languages, right? So I don't think that I think in English. I think I think in thought. Right? So uh, uh, a lot will depend on that. And I think that rationality, therefore, that's my at least assumption, is more fundamental than the expression of it in different codes. Uh, so we are capable, for instance, of learning many languages and producing new languages. And I think this is already a form of rational behavior. We do, of course, know that we don't behave, you know, statistically speaking, very rational all the time. You know, 24, you know, I don't spend, unfortunately, even as a philosopher, right, who adores rationality, I don't spend 24 hours a day being rational. Most of the time I sleep and uh, the other, uh, you know, 12 hours or so, I'm not always rational, as we all know. So, but I do think that there is something like a very high level of logically and scientifically controlled rationality, which can or cannot be attached to very high levels of rationality. But even that, of course, is limited in human beings due to the fact that we are also part of the animal kingdom, which, as it were, draws us down from the highest level of uh, the exercise of our rational capacities. We're not all like uh, uh, Spock in Star Trek, I guess, completely not rational. Not at all. <laughs> Jane, have you observed rational behavior in your animal observations in the animal kingdom? Yes, well, I think half the time they are rational. They do things that make sense. It depends how you define rationality. But if you behave in a rational way, you don't have to be using uh, some very high caliber part of your brain, I think, at least in the way I think of being rational. You make the right decision at the right time. And chimpanzees are, you know, they can immediately sense which other individuals are in the group because it's always changing, which is one way I think that's pushed them to being highly intelligent. So one minute, this young adolescent male is cock of the hoop. He's number one. All the females are subservient to him. But now he notices from the corner of his eye that a higher ranking male is arriving. His behavior changes, boom. It's very rational. He now no longer shows off. He stops displaying. In fact, he will go up and give a submissive greeting to the arriving male. And this kind of thing is happening all the time. And they have their own personalities, their own way of doing things. And it's just, you know, we're still learning new things about these chimpanzees after 60 years. We had our 60th anniversary of the research at Gombe. And of course, we're learning uh, more and more about the different chimpanzee cultural behaviors, the young ones observing. Long childhood relates to the fact they have an awful lot to learn. So they don't start leaving their mothers till they're at least seven and maybe older because they're watching, learning from the adults. So to me, they behave in a very rational way and other animals too, many animals. Are there different levels of rationality then though that, that may distinguish us? And what about things like empathy? Um... Well, they have empathy. Um, they've even discovered, I read recently, and I can't remember the details, but just a few days ago, I read a paper about empathy in rats. Rats can detect if another fellow rat is feeling pain and they behave in a different way. Uh, and rats mm. will share food. Chimpanzees, of course, definitely, they're empathetic. And there are wonderful stories. I mean, I collect up anecdotes, which is scientifically frowned upon. But to me, an anecdote is something that maybe you see once or twice, and you can't prove it scientifically, because for that you need numbers. But to me, seeing something happen, which is unusual, can really give you an aha moment. And yeah. uh, so, yeah, there's different levels in different animals, of course. But they're with us, too, I think. I think we show different levels of empathy mm -hmm. and rationality and so on. Quite, quite true. Bill, let's talk a little, go back to some 
uh, neurobiology, if you will, because George raised the possibility of this brain to brain direct uh, interaction. We've already seen, you know, ample examples of electrodes on the brain being able to control uh, prosthetic limbs and so forth. Uh, but this thinking to thinking as opposed to simple motor skills, what would that do to, uh, to our humanity or our humanness, if, if you will? Is that, is that short-circuiting it a little, as, as George suggests? Max, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and actually, I don't think that's where the action is. I think the action okay. is making our own language and our own intentions uh, as pro-social and as supportive of one another as possible. It may be that someday we'll challenge the angels, but I don't think anytime soon. I, I want to go back to the empathy question. And I want to, again, sort of agree with Jane. It, it turns out that there is empathy in ants. I mean, we're not, the, 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 the context in which empathy arises is not unique to humans by any means. And certainly it's absolutely right that, that chimps and other non-human primates evidence this. It's largely at the level of emotional contagion. It's largely at the level of what frightens that chimp frightens me. What's, what's alarming to that chimp is alarming to me. Well, and it, there's a brain basis for this. And it's very clear that different brain regions are involved in emotional contagion. As for example, one infant crying in the nursery and other infants crying in, in turn. Very different than the emotion, than the empathy circuit in which one can do not only understanding another's distress, resonating with that, but actually taking a perspective on their distress. And ultimately, converting their distress into a clear pattern of motor behavior that results in compassion. I also think that hap must happen in chimps. They comfort one another, they deal with one another, they console one another, they, they, they recognize pain in another. And so I think, again, we go back to the brain and we ask, what is the brain basis for empathy and compassion? And to what extent does it differ across species? And if there's a limitation in a chimp relative to a human characteristic, what's that look like? What's the biological basis for that? Because by understanding the limits to empathy and compassion in non-humans, we may learn a whole lot about how humans do have that capacity and are, are really quite capable in the right setting where emotional contagion is suppressed, not only to empathize effectively, but to take a perspective and to reach out with compassion. So I, I wanna go back to the biology. If a species can do something, but it normally doesn't do something, is it in the brain, in the social cultural construct that the brain is created or some combination of those two? That's where real wisdom lies. And go back to anecdotes. In our lab, we love the experiments that don't work because they teach us where the future may well lie in that line of experimentation. The data point that doesn't fit is almost certainly a clue to real wisdom about what's going on in that system. One of the other uh, issues or questions that has been put out there as the difference between um, humans and the rest of the animal kingdom is free will and uh, decision-making. That's, uh, that's pretty fuzzy, but let me throw it out to, uh, to the group there. Do we have free will, and does that make us different? I wouldn't say it made us different. I think animals are capable of making decisions as well. They're not, they're not governed by instinct, as people used to think, and they can, they can choose what to do. And it will differ from situation to situation, individual to individual. So I think that, you know, a lot, of course, depends on what we mean by free will, right? So is it the freedom to choose, right, uh, you know, between a given set of options, uh, however large the set of options, or is there like another kind of capacity associated with the term free will? 
And I think that, you know, like a more demanding conception of free will that go that transcends the idea of having of being able to choose between, say, vanilla and chocolate ice cream, right, or going left or right, uh, you know, a different conception would be to form a conception of oneself as an agent. For instance, right, Jane mentioned, uh, you know, social hierarchy, uh, hierarchies and other uh, mammals, in particular, uh, other great apes, but they don't typically discuss the, the issue of gender inequality, right? So, you know, is it, a is it fair that we have alpha males? What about the alpha females, right? Or what about, uh, you know, other issues of diversity? What about apes on other continents, right? Do we treat them fairly if we eat up whatever, you know, the bamboo here? Right. So uh, think, you know, changing the conception of oneself as an agent. I think this is a different capacity, which philosophers call autonomy, right? Giving oneself the law. And I think that this might be unique to humans. I call this higher morality. I think that higher morality ha clearly has uh, evolutionary necessary conditions in pro-social behavior uh, uh, of other animals as well. But as, uh, I doubt that other animals do this. Right. So. We can think about the fact that, for instance, elephants, uh, you know, suffer if we kill their children, right, by thinking of themselves as analogous to us. And so we think we ought not to do this, right? So whereas lions don't typically discuss whether they should become vegetarians in light of the fact that they hurt the gazelles. And I think that this higher level of, you know, uh, behavioral modification is a different, you know, as it were, a different beast of morality and rational behavior. So I think that free will in a more demanding sense refers to this capacity of giving oneself the law of action, right? And that I do not see in, as it were, mere, mere sounds like a smear word, right? But in, in, in pro-social behavior, I think human morality is more than pro-social behavior, which is why morality is also not identical to altruism. George, this sounds like something right up a philosopher's alley here. Yeah, exactly. I think really going going along the same lines suggested by Marcus, I think there is an intuitive notion of freedom, one that does not put us outside of nature, and that is freedom is a measure of behavioral control. It's a kind of practical freedom that living beings need to pursue their goals in a world that continually presents them with multiple possibilities. And I think you can break it down into three main components, the ability to generate options, to eliminate options in meaningful ways by weighing the pros and cons, and to carry out the actions we've chosen. People call it willpower. And I think if you, in principle, you could devise a scale, an FQ scale, a freedom quotient scale, to measure how freedom can actually grow along all of these three dimensions. And if you look at evolution from this perspective, both biological and cultural, there has been a veritable explosion of free will in this sense. Um, you go from instinct to individual learning. You add imagining possible outcomes and evaluating them without actually doing it. You add social learning and imitation. You add the cumulative wisdom that is stored in cultural practices. You add the systematic construction of learning environments, aka education. You add the scientific method for formulating hypotheses and evaluating them experimentally. Or democracy as a method of political self-governance. That degraded notion of free will as socially and culturally extendable, and I think it connects with real life issues and concerns much better than a supernatural notion of free will. I'm just gonna mention two points here. First, it helps us understand the relationship between free will and social and political freedom. In what ways does restricting access to education or brainwashing people with propaganda hinder the development of FQ? And it also ties in with the idea of positive liberty, the idea that the person should not just be free from constraints, but be given the skills and opportunities to pursue a fulfilling life. So I think that's a perfectly meaningful notion of free will that is compatible with determinism at some possible f fundamental physical level. But I think it's a very meaningful notion and it can evolve over time. So the other question or other uh, characteristic that's often put out as a difference here. And Bill, I think I'll start out with you is consciousness, because I think we can define it perhaps neurobiologically, but much more difficult to define it uh, in, in other terms. Uh, is, is consciousness something that's simply uh, activity or lack or unconsciousness, lack of activity, electrical activity in the brain? One level, of course, awareness depends 
upon simple awareness depends upon brain function. Obviously, uh, somebody in a coma is, you know, defined as being unconscious. But I think consciousness has a kind of a different feeling to it. My sense of it is knowing that I know something. It's not just knowing something, it's knowing that I know something. And that's one of the places where the human brain is really excellent. We think about what we think about. We try to make meaning of our lives. We try to make meaning of our meanings. And much of philosophy is basically built around thinking about what we think about. The brain's really good at that. But I, again, I don't want to suggest for a moment that that is completely absent in different species. There surely is decision-making in other species. And, and to some extent, they, there is a kind of freedom. But I really, I'm not sure I like the word free will or the term free will, because in it, however elaborate our brains are, however elaborate our you know, set of options might be, however carefully we've analyzed those options one by one, what extent are we really free to choose an option that's less good for us? Is it really free or is it just an elaborate, careful cataloging of the options we have available? Mostly, I think it's the latter. Mostly, I think we catalog options, we think deeply, and we choose the one that's best for us. Is that free? Is that free will or is that just will? Supposing we choose an option that is not best for us, but is best for someone else. Is that, is that consciousness? Is that free will? Is that rationality, Jane? I don't know. I mean, uh, th there's so much confusion about these terms. Still, nobody's really agreed on consciousness. Um, I think we've agreed that animals are sentient. Uh, consciousness, I know there was a definition of the Cambridge definition of consciousness under the auguses of Stephen Hawking, but um, you know, that there's still no real consensus on what we mean by it. And all of these things that, that have been discussed, I don't think any of these sort of things could have happened if we hadn't developed a spoken language to be able to discuss them with each other, to formulate them in a meaningful way in our minds. I, I still keep coming back to that because to me, it just seems to make all the difference in the world. Some, something George brought up, uh, I, I believe it was George, um, also though struck me as our ability to think through the consequences of our actions, not just say, this is hot, don't touch it, uh, but I can choose path A or path B and think through what the consequences are. Do you, do you observe that in, in the chimps or is that something that might be unique? Well, I think it, it might be unique. I mean, I've always said, that, uh, you know, for, for example, <clears throat> we can, we have within us all, there are these two warring uh, elements. On the one hand, we can be extremely noble, altruistic, including sacrificing our lives. And on the other hand, we're capable of horrendous evil and torture. And, you know, you don't have to look very far to see examples, even in our own lives. And so I've always said that, you know, being human, because we can actually think these things through and develop a system of morality, we're capable of greater altruism because we can think through, if I do this to save that person, that's going to have negative consequences for me or for my family. So now I make a choice. Do I actually damage myself and my family? Uh, because I'm really concerned about that, or just damage myself, let's forget the family. And just as we're capable then of greater leaps of altruism, so too greater evil, because we can sit in cold blood and plan a torture of somebody who isn't even anywhere near, and sit back gleefully thinking of the screams of pain that will emerge as a result of our plan.
And to me, that shows we can be more noble and we can be more evil. Both extremes. Uh, I want to be uh, respectful of our panelists' times as well as our, uh, our viewers. And I always like to ask our, our panelists for a little pearl of wisdom, a take home lesson that you want someone to remember. Please make it brief because we only have a few minutes left. Um, George, what, what would you like our viewers to take home from this? I, I think and this is something that has to do with the, the future of humanity and the impact that technologies will increasingly have uh, on our minds and our bodies. I think that the, the notion of the human is surprisingly vague and open-ended. And I think that it's open-ended in the sense that which qualities we really associate with it and what set of beings do we think have them. And the more and more we discover about the psychology of non-human animals, plants even, there's been a revival of interest in plant cognition, but at the same time, the more we also build machines that are capable of having some of those qualities, the more I think we will have to move away from the traditional conception of the human as a homo sapiens that really is fairly recent um, in, in, in modern times. It goes back to Carl Linnaeus in the 18th century, right? Where Linnaeus kind of defined the human as well, an upright ape with the soul, but the possession of the soul is tied to a very specific physical substrate. And I think in the future, um, the notion of personhood that we inherit from the Christian tradition, I think we're gonna have to stretch that notion. And I think it's possible to actually accommodate a variety of other creatures, animals, machines, under that expanded notion of personhood. Bill, how would you respond or what would you say to all of us? I would say relish the wisdom of animals, create your own Gombe camp and live in it like Jane did. Because if you do, you will understand the wisdom of animals, the beautiful biology that uh, makes it possible for them to live and to, and to care for one another. And we can learn a lot from them. And that we're not so different from them. We're not at all, we're different, but we're different in ways that are degrees as opposed to, you know, ones and zeros. So establish one's own Gombe camp and watch animals and watch their brains work. Marcus, what should we remember? Well, I tend to define the human being as the animal desperately trying not to be one or as the American philosopher Stanley Cavell has once put it, nothing is more human than the wish to deny one's own humanity. And I would like to transform that adage into nothing is more human than the wish to deny one's own animality. And I think this is quite characteristic of the human being, the capacity to try to lead a life as if, as if we weren't animals. And I think this is the source of much evil uh, including, of course, the destruction of our planet, of our own species and other species, in virtue precisely of our capacity of the highest level rational thought that's possible. So I think that we need to compensate for our overly one-sided natural scientific technological culture by going back to the insight that we are integrated into a larger natural context, which we will never be able to fully dominate. And Jane, as, as one who has probably bridged this uh, gulf, some people would call it, between humans and other animals, you get the last word. Well, you started off by reminding us that it was Martin, Martin Luther King Day. And so I just wanted to uh, read this, one of his statements. One day, the absurdity of the almost universal human belief in the slavery of other animals will be palpable. We shall then have discovered our souls and become worthier of sharing this planet with them. And all the major religions share the golden rule, do to others as you would have them do to you. And if we can apply that to animals as well as to each other, then I think we shall be coming closer to being able to define ourselves as homo sapiens.
Well, I think that qualifies as a pearl of wisdom. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane, Marcus, Bill, and George, for taking the time to be here with us today and sharing your insights. There's so much food for thought uh, in this past hour. And we hope our audience found this conversation informative, and we'll be sending you a follow-up questionnaire to get your feedback. Please take the time to share your views with us. And in the meantime, please stay, stay safe and healthy. And on behalf of the Cura Foundation and the Vatican's Pontifical Council for Culture, Thank you for joining our discussion and wear a mask, please.